Good morning, everybody. So my topic is uh, focused on the process of developing a risk-based standard. Um, and it's less about the standard, or I, I will be mentioning that during this, this discussion, but it's more about some observations of the process we used to develop it. So many of you will be aware of the Flight Safety Foundation. It's uh, an independent, international, and impartial, not-for-profit organization that promotes aviation safety. And about 10 years ago, uh, at the behest of the um, mining industry, they did some work to develop what was, became, is now the first of a suite of uh, aviation standards. So that the original was called the Basic Aviation Risk Standard. Um, and the, there's a couple of clues in the name. Um, this is an aviation standard that's risk-based and basic. I, I know, I've not really told you much there. The key bit about it being basic is it's not meant to be um, the ultimate standard. It still allows people who, who use the bar standard to add their own additional requirements to it. But it was designed to try and create a common standard across what was originally the mining industry so that when mining companies contracted for aviation, they all started with the same basic requirements so that the, the operators would see a common set of requirements to, 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 to focus on. Um, and part of the reason for doing this was to help raise the standards across a very diverse sector of industry, um, be it in Canada, South Africa, uh, the Congo, Russia, or Australia, all sorts of places where there's big mining exploration. Um, the standard has evolved since then. Uh, it turns out, for example, who would have guessed? But a lot of Australian mining companies actually are landlords for big cattle ranches because if you want to get the mineral rights, you have to buy what's on top. And what do you do on an Australian cattle ranch from an aviation perspective? Well, you chase cattle around with an R22 to get them where you want them to be. So actually now there's a bar standard for aerial mustering and various other things. So the, the foundation has uh, expanded interest beyond mining. So for example, um, a lot of humanitarian aid agencies now use bars to set their requirements. And that's led to the development of an airdrop standard for dropping aid in Africa out of Hercules and Aleutians. Anyway, um, BARS is managed by a program office in Melbourne, Australia from the Flight Safety Foundation. But the standard itself is overseen by an industry technical advisory committee. Um, when they do upgrades to the standard, they consult with industry, including, for example, on the offshore standard, we're going to talk about organisations like Heli Offshore. And the standards are regularly reviewed and revised to a schedule. So the next revision for the offshore standard is coming up over the next few months. Now, you can, as some of the mining companies do, subscribe to an independent audit programme. Uh, and that means that they get one audit done on one operator instead of dozens of uh, mining companies visiting. And it's easy to do because it is a common standard. That is available, but it's not an essential part of the program. The standards that we're going to talk about and all the implementation guidance is completely free and is completely available to use and download off the Flight Safety Foundation website. So from an offshore perspective, um, originally the, the basic original bar standard had a supplement added to build in some extra requirements for offshore a few years ago. But in 2014, the foundation and the technical advisory committee decided they really wanted a specific offshore standard. And if you think back to 2014, there was a lot of um, development work, uh, consultation going on on Paul Hoffo in Europe. Uh, the UK CAA had published CAP 1145. So there was a big interest in uh, revisiting uh, offshore standards anyway. 
So as I say, version four is um, soon to be in preparation, but the final key thing to emphasize in this bit of the introduction is the standard has been designed to be contractible. It's not a guidance document where you could gives you lots of useful information, and then you decide what to do. It's very clear in setting out specific standard requirements to achieve. So it's easy to write into a contract. Anyway, that's the background. Now, the way the, the, these standards have been developed in a risk-based way is by using bow ties. Now, this is the only bit of audience participation. Don't worry, it's not too frightening. If you're familiar, at least aware of the concept of bow ties, could you, could you make a small... OK, OK. Not surprisingly, over the years, it's become quite a well-known idea. It evolved from um, the late 1970s. It seems that ICI, the chemical company, was one of the first people to really promote the idea and it got a lot of traction in the oil and gas industry in the 80s and 90s. Um, if you haven't seen this but are... So, a safety systems person. If you look at this quickly, the left-hand side is basically a fault tree. All the ways that a certain bad event in the middle in orange here can develop. And the right-hand side is an event tree. If that event happens, what are all the consequences that can develop? And scattered across the diagram are controls to either prevent that event happening or to mitigate it when it does. So it's quite a nice graphical layout that makes it quite easy to explain how you control hazards and how you manage safety. So it's great, and that's why it's popular. Now, in practice, what is nice, simple, coloured in this case, easy to present, can become a little bit more difficult in practice. Um, the left-hand side, these are some bow ties from about, from about 15 years ago. Um, but it's, uh, this particular one was a helicopter operation. Uh, it was done in Excel. It's a very big table. Um, the left-hand side was one Excel spreadsheet because it was too difficult to do them both in Excel. It was only 30 pages of detailed text long. And as you can see, it's terribly clear. Um, yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> like that particular example, it's one threat four threat controls, they've got probably three or four escalations each, and then there's, well, you can do the maths, lots and lots of controls all referenced against document. And the right-hand side typically turned out to be a bit simpler because the right-hand side was often more common to the threats, and that's sort of reverse. So um, certainly I ended up doing some work uh, back in 2005 going, oh, there must be a better way, must be a better way. So we had a look at the software products available, and there was, at that time, there was one particularly good software product, which is a company we went and bought. And the software is good. You can develop and manage complex bow ties. But as you see on the right, which is a genuine aviation bow tie, do you know the theory of the diagrams can get a little bit out of control? Um, it's fine if you want to wallpaper your office. And I have seen companies that have literally covered their walls in their bow ties from ceiling to floor. Um, but they have some limitations. So in using a bow tie in this, we are going to do something that will upset people who are very, very bow tie methodology G focused because we've created a sort of a pseudo bow tie. We've made some compromises. Actually, the things you do when you manage safety, you make compromises, and we've done this in our methodology. So what we ended up creating, and, and this is effectively the second generation, I'll explain why we've gone through two generations, um, is, is something that's um, more instinctive. And I'll go through five features. The, the reason it's um, two generations. We did the first one uh, at the end of 2014, beginning of 2015, and we were invited to um, the Heli Offshore opening conference in 2015, um, and we were asked to bring a copy of that bow tie along, so I can never volunteer to do this. I carried 250 printed copies in my suitcase, wrapped up with so much bubble wrap so they'd survive. And we passed them out around the room, and they 
started a discussion. Um, and really the second generation of uh, this document was uh, Heli Offshore did some work on what became their safety performance model, which is at the heart of their safety initiatives. They did that um, with close liaison with EASA uh, and looking at some of EASA's safety data. And we have then adapted our model so that we all align. Hence the Heli Offshore and Flight Safety Foundation logos on this particular um, diagram. So I want to point out five features. Number one feature is it fits on one page. Um, ideally, if you were going to read it, A3 is most readable. Ideal for the two spread pages of, of the standards document. But it is something that we can put on a slide and talk to a large group of people and we've got a reasonable chance of understanding the logic. That's the first observation. The second observation is uh, what here are called accident threats or accident types down the left-hand side, that first column. Um, when we were doing the development, we started with what was the ICAO cast common taxonomy. Um, things that if you're in really keen on classifying accidents, you'll be familiar with loss of control in flight, loss of control on the ground, uh, system failures, non-power plant, system failures, power plant, and many others. There's about 30, 35 items on this list, some of which are more fixed wing, some have been amended for, for rotorcraft. So we started with that list. That was too many to be practical. So we've merged certain ones of those categories. Um, certain ones have been renamed under our harmonization project with, with our partners. Um, but we started with categories of what were basically accidents that did map to how um, the authorities uh, and agencies like EASA were classifying accidents. So we can link these particular accident threats with accident data and safety data. First, second observation now. Now, the next way we tried to make this a simpler process was by taking out what we've now called common enablers. These are things that affect two or three or more, even all, of those accident threats. So, for example, the second one along is having an effective safety management system. And the features within that would, if you did a big complex bow tie using software, feature all across the, the table and make it much larger. We've taken them out and accepted that we will list these common enablers at the bottom of the page. Um, because we were doing a standards exercise, we were able to slip a few little key features to make points that we wanted. So we didn't just stop at safety management systems. The first item on the list is about safety leadership and culture, which we thought was important in a standard. Uh, the third one was about information sharing, uh, because we felt inside the foundation and also um, in organizations like Hadley Offshore, that that collaborative approach to sharing information is a key part, a key enabler for safety. So we separated out these key enablers at the bottom. That's the third point. Now the fourth point, now this is the bit that bow tie gurus really hate. The bow tie philosophy is that bit in the middle of the bow tie is, is a loss of control. Um, not in the aviation term, um, which sometimes causes confusion, uh, but if you think of it being a chemical plant, this is the point that your chemical process has run away from you and some nasty toxic chemical is going to vent itself unless you turn the right valves to keep it contained. So that's what that event would be. We made the decision that we were actually going to call that an aircraft accident. Um, it's, as I say, for bow tie people, that's controversial. Um, our view was what this did is it put the avoiding an accident on the left and it made all the survivability and rescue activity on the right. That helps for a number of reasons. Um, it also takes out another form of duplication because on the left hand side, you will have things like your normal procedures. So your normal procedures, so you don't fly into another aircraft, includes a number of things you do, uh, liaison with air traffic, how you use systems, et cetera, et cetera. And when you get a loss of control, you 
become closer, you lose your minimum separation from the aircraft, well, you have some emergency procedures. So suddenly, well, where do you put TCAS? Is it on the left-hand side, helping you avoid that situation? Or is it on the right-hand side, when the resolution advisory then tells you how to avoid the other aircraft? And you train to use TCAS to avoid things in the first place, but then you'll have training on the right-hand side to train how to respond to a resolution advisory. So suddenly your training program has been split into two, doubled up, when actually it's much simpler, we felt, to have the training on the left-hand side there. Oh, in fact, as part of the common enablers. Now, the fifth observation was how we treated the, um, the survival factors on the right. Um, now, in a traditional bow tie, these radiate out as possible um, consequences. Actually, in practice, when we distill these down, these are almost in a vertical order as well, because what we've done is we followed a concept that was in the UK CAA's Ross report, um, a report they did in the mid-1990s after the Cormorant Alpha helicopter accident, when an aircraft ditched into a high sea state in the North Sea. And the very first goal in these types of accidents is you need to survive the impact. If you don't survive the impact, everything else is not very useful. The next thing is you really want the aircraft to float. That's quite good, at least for a bit of time. Then, if it doesn't float, you want to get out from inside the aircraft. Uh, no matter how you get out the aircraft, you do want to survive in the sea, and so on. So actually, there is a cascade here where it sort of builds together all those survival factors to the end point where search and rescue have been alerted, they arrive, and you are rescued and treated in hospital if you need to be. So we took that approach um, because, again, it made it uh, quite logical to group controls together for their common purpose. So that's the overall layout. That's the, the key bit of this presentation. Now, just for background, oh, I'll go back one. Each of those little boxes, such as detect and avoid obstacles, uh, is backed, as you would expect, by some standard. Um, so the standard is the bit in the middle, the meat in the sandwich in, in this document, a bit in red. But actually, we also wrote an objective. We tried to set out a high-level safety objective for everything we put in. Now, these are probably an area we still need to refine as we go to get these really succinct and clear on what the ultimate objective is. But it does, we found, help your thinking if you start with an objective before you write the requirement. Um, in the bar system, then, there is also some stuff we call the implementation guidance. It is genuine guidance. It's not the only means of compliance. It's trying to get the operators and their customers on the same page of what's relevant for controlling uh, this particular uh, hazard. Um, but the standard bit that's in red is the specific contractable requirement. So overall observations are on this, this development process. Um, what we found is we were, we were using the bow tie quite proactively to structure the standard which is in contrast to how many people use bow ties. In many cases, they have their procedures, they have the equipped aircraft, and then they use a bow tie to try and show that what they've done is adequate. Um, we found it was quite interesting to start with what were we trying to achieve and structure around that, as opposed to, if you're writing standards normally, you'll write some engineering stuff, you'll write some flight operations stuff, maybe then some flight training stuff, don't forget ground operations, we'll add a section for them, and it all becomes silo-based and functional. Um, certainly, we felt there was a lot of value in structuring a standard around the threats. Um, it discourages frivolous requirements. Those little hobby horses, which we all have, actually, when you lay out common controls together, or common themes, if something really doesn't add much value, it does jump out um, in that type of analysis. Um, you can identify things that are similar, which is good, and more importantly, you can identify things that are obsolete, things that may have been the way we avoided uh, flying into sea 20 or 30 years ago, things like AVAD, 
now actually we might be putting a bigger emphasis on different systems. So how do you balance maybe stuff that traditional but should remain, stuff that's traditional but been superseded, and, and new approaches. So it's useful for that. It certainly gives a very clear overall picture, and it's proven very useful to have discussions about the detail of the standard, if you can actually have it in front of you on one page. Uh, it's certainly a lot easier to explain and discuss, which is a great relief to me. Um, last two questions. Or observations, I, you might wonder if you were to write your own procedures manuals, whether actually it would be better to group common procedures that control similar threats together. Um, because after all, you want your people to learn when they read the manuals, not use them as a sort of giant, mixed up, difficult to search document where you flick through to find things backwards and forwards. Maybe there's a way of making your, your procedures better. And hey, maybe one day regulators will look at this and say, our job is to have performance risk focused regulation. Perhaps we should start by assessing the, the, the risks and how the hazards should be controlled before we put pen to paper and create regulations. Just a thought. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say on this. Uh, we'll now head into the questions. And thank you very much for all your attention. Thank you.